Welcome back, everybody. Um, I think I have to say it every time now because I just get so excited before one of these support groups. Um, I just have to voice that because it helps me get my excitement out and I can, you know, take a chill pill and calm down before the speaker comes on to share her story. So today we have my wonderful friend Tracy. Um, Tracy is such an inspiration to me. She is body goals, nutrition goals, and all the goals, I think, for a young stroke survivor. Um, and today she's going to share her story, um, her experience with stroke, and talk about how you know we can get back to physical fitness and exercise, especially if we have an affected side, how we can start working on that side to strengthen it. And um, definitely don't shy away from physical activity just because you feel or you might have some weakness on a certain side due to your stroke. So I will stop there and I will turn it over to Tracy. Thank you again, Tracy, for being here and the floor is yours. Well, I really have nothing else to say because Ella just talked. <laughs> but no, I love Ella, so thank you so much. So hi everyone, I am Tracy. My stroke was, now I've said it so much, I'm having a brain freeze, January 25th of 2019. January 25th of 2019, give you the brief story because it's kind of long. Traveled to California for a fitness show. Passed out the morning of the fitness show and woke up three days later for them to tell me I had a stroke. So leading up to it, after they woke me up and did everything, I, they put me in a medical induced coma. I'll get to that story pretty soon. My whole thing was, they kept saying, do you know what happened to you? I'm like, nothing but like I just need to get up so that's the base of how everything how my reaction was as being I'm totally fine you guys are crazy and let me just get up and get out of here so of course they said okay try it I got up and that's what I see unless I didn't work so then we back up to the story of how this happened so basically as traveling to California I didn't realize it then I was starting to have the the, uh, the blood clot was actually traveling mid-flight, but I didn't notice it. And the reason I didn't notice it because I previous had no health issues at all, other than the year before I had a knee injury where it's going to sound crazy, I, not crazy, but 400 pounds were dropped on my knee and I tore my knee in three places. So that was originally caused the blood clot with that we didn't know about. So the process of that, I opted out of surgery and I just did the rehab. So I did a rehab for 20 weeks with a, an extensive knee brace on. Past rehabilitation went from not even being able to be into full recovery uh, per se to the point that I was able to go to a fitness show. So in January, going to a fitness show because I'm full recovery, excited about doing whatever at the fitness show, and I pass out the morning of the fitness show. As they run the test trying to figure out why this such healthy girl had these issues, they come to find out they had to, actually had to bring a specialist in because everybody was confused. Like, we didn't see anything pop up. And the specialist goes, have you ever had any trauma to the body? And that's when I said, oh, nonchalantly, oh, yeah, 400 pounds dropped on my knee. And she goes... Gosh, well, thank you. That's where this 12-inch blood clot came from that was in your leg. I'm like, okay, that's weird because I've been going to the doctor. Nobody saw it. And their whole process was, thank God you didn't pass out on the plane. And how did you not realize? So I have to tell you that part of the story of the plane because it's so exciting but crazy. So traveling on the plane. So it was, I was traveling from Cleveland, Ohio. So the weather was bad in January. So the flight was um, kind of rerouted somehow. So instead of it being like a five-hour flight, we were on the plane for like six and a half hours. So it was kind of like everybody was on the plane, like it's just a horrible plane ride. So the stewardess, everybody like, oh, we're just going to, everybody just bear with us. I think at this point they were giving away free drinks. Like everybody just calmed down because it was a horrible plane ride. So I went from sitting normal and then I was like, oh my gosh, my legs feel like they're 200 pounds. So luckily I they say I saved myself because I, for whatever reason, I flipped upside down. I literally took my legs placed my leg on the guy next to me's head. He, he didn't say anything. And I had my head in the guy next to me's lap. Like literally, the I rode the plane like that for like maybe the next hour and a half. But I think everybody was kind of like just annoyed with the plane ride. So nobody said anything. But now thinking about it, like after I told the story, I'm like, that's crazy as hell. Like, I wish I knew who this was. I knew who this was on my right, but I wish I knew who that guy was. But literally, and I almost want to say, I think he was like in some type of medical field because he instantly knew to cover my eyes because I was on the plane. I was like, 
oh my gosh, and I'm screaming, like, like turn the lights off, but I'm kind of freaking out because I've never had migraines or anything, like not even at all. So I was going through the press, the pressures of whatever was happening. So with me flipping my tip upside down, they said that kind of relaxed everything. And, I, and I'm assuming it stopped the blood clot from traveling in a sense. And that was my plane ride. Got off the plane ride. I actually made it to sleep that night, slept and everything. Got up the next morning, la di da. And my process of how, and I'm going to tell my story with that because everyone says like, yeah, I am a little, I was not the word crazy, but I am a little spastic because I do everything so fast and I thought. So I got up that morning, I'm like, oh, and I went to say a prayer that I normally say every morning. I'm like, still didn't think of it. I'm like, that's weird. Can't figure out the prayer. Brushed it off, tried to say it again. I literally tried to say it three times. Still didn't realize anything. So all of the signs were there, but I didn't realize so I never had any health issues. So I say, okay, brush it off. I'll just say a prayer. Let me go into the kitchen. I'm just, and I'm the whole time I'm just making up a soup. I'm like, I'm hungry, baby. That's what it is. I go to the kitchen, turn on some oatmeal, about to cook, and I reach down to put my shoe on. I felt my lip quiver. I drop, but when I drop, I still jump back up. And so, actually, my boyfriend at the time he goes, "You're crazy," and literally pick me up. He's a big guy. Pick me up with one hand and put me on the bed. Instantly called nine one one. So. I'm still coherent and talking to him. I'm like, okay, you're crazy. You're calling 911 and there's nothing wrong with me. So this whole process of me still saying nothing wrong with me after all of this happened, thank God he did because I went from nothing wrong to me with me to literally hitting him to try to get his hand off of me to going into a seizure. And boom, pass out after that, wake up in the hospital three days later. So that's my wonderful story of how this happened. I knew nothing about it. So the process of going through the hospital, once they told me, we figured out the specialist came in, that's what happened with my mind. So I have to tell that story so you can see how my mind works already because I'm gonna, I'm constantly gonna fight with everybody about, no, 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 you guys are tripping. There's nothing wrong with me. So after they told me, I said, okay, well, stroke is a person that's overweight, out of shape, older, like I'm fitness for a living. I'm a bodybuilder. Like there is, I have no health issues. All of the above. So, okay, granted, now, Statistics shows stroke can happen to anybody. So that's that's my story now. Stroke can happen to anybody. The most healthy being the fact that I had a blood clot and think about it. So my whole thought process instantly went to, so you're telling me the stroke and no offense to us or anybody on the call, me and my thought, even though I've been in the health industry for 20 years, my whole knowledge of a stroke survivor was like, wait a minute. So we're completely... You're telling me you're paralyzed on one side. I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm going to be walking in a wheelchair. So I, all of the negative things came to head. And I instantly was like, oh, yeah, that's not me. And so the doctor was like, you know, statistics say, and I, the whole time I just kept saying, I'm not going to be your statistics. I will not be statistics. And so they're laughing at me, but they're like, okay, okay. So we're going back and forth, battling the whole time. I will say just to skim to the story, I was back up walking within three weeks. And that's because I kept telling them, I, can, I cannot sit in one because I'm not even a person that can sit down. Like I probably throughout a 20 hour period of the day, I maybe sit down 30 minutes because I've, I've always been on the go. But then to top that off, that's how I was before stroke. Then the uh, specialist comes and she says, to, I want to tell your family to watch out because where you had your brain bleed, um, it causes, I can't remember, it causes very spastic reactions. I said, oh, well, that's a problem because I've already been like that in the first place. So naturally, how I was already with one of those people do things without thought, then you tell me that's what the brain bleed was. So I said, well, you guys really have a problem because I'm going to be even worse. So again, and I laugh about it because that's really, as I know I'm talking fast now, so I had to learn that was another thing. I've already talked fast. And then I get the passion behind me makes me talk even faster. So excuse me in the beginning if I start rambling on very fast. But that's my whole little thing. But my whole thought process in the beginning, and the reason I'm saying that is because it's, 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 I'm learning even through the process and before it's the mind over matter. And a lot of things we do as we, a lot of things we do, I, I started to start recording myself saying a quick thought for me as because I'll be thinking about something and I just do it when I, so it's like to think about something, we think too much, basically we can handicap ourselves. I do a lot of the things without reaction of thought. And it's to say, oh, wow, you just did that. And the reason I'm saying that is because we have to think about our lives pre-stroke. Before we had a stroke, we were adults. We did these things. We cooked, we ate, we got ourselves dressed. After we had our stroke, yes, we had that brain disconnect that our brain forgot how to do the things. And basically, it takes us back to an infant stage. 
So if it has to relearn and if it has to relearn all these things, but you got to look at it, uh, if it relearns all these things by looking and paying attention to people and then you're picking up things as natural. We naturally had that before our stroke. Yes, the disconnect happened, but what I'm learning for myself and as I go about things and I, I'll do things without, if I think too much, it's like, shucks, my hand is going to hurt if I do this or my hand may not pick this up. My hand may not do that. I, I push myself to do things without thought. And in the reality as I used to do this before and I even talk and my hands work now, but I talk to myself, like, don't think about it. I used to put my shoes on standing up on one leg. I used to do this, do it like this. And those type of things like that, that's really telling myself, get out of my own head. So therefore it helps me to push myself more because coming home after my stroke, I live by myself and everything. I kind of went through the fact of, oh my gosh, who's going to help me? I'm a chef. Who's going to start cooking my food? But at the same time, I wouldn't allow myself to get all the way there because I'm so independent. So I, again, that was me getting out of my brain to say, you can't allow yourself to be stuck in this state as, yes, this happened before. Guess what, Tracy? You were doing this prior to your stroke. So we have to, re we have to really talk ourselves out of it. We can't allow ourselves, like, yes, we may look in the mirror and see a disability or something, a disabled effect, uh, feature or factor that we may have. We got to look at where we've come, where we are now and where we were before we had the stroke. And so we have to learn how, we have to figure out how to find that control of ourselves to say we are better than this and we deserve more. We deserve to keep pushing ourselves more to keep going from there. So in relation to that, as those were just things that I had to learn how to live with, I just kept telling myself, and, and to me, I kept telling myself, I don't want to have to depend on anybody else. I don't want to have to do this. Even in the midst of me saying that, even when my hand wasn't even open, I was still, I don't want to have to depend on anybody. And I did a video the other day. I saw I would get myself dressed, put a, a lotion on my face. Yes, my hand wasn't open. I would put the lotion on the top of my hand and I would do this. And everybody would say, kind of like, you're just being stubborn because you don't want us to help. No, I'm not being stubborn. That goes back to my brain as I'm an adult. So, so many of us go through that. I'm an adult. I don't want anybody to have to keep doing this for me. And that could be stubbornness at the same time. But at the same time, what that's doing is it's pushing me to push myself even more to say, no, I'm going to figure this out. And even though it's not perfect, doesn't mean it's not right. And so in the beginning, I would do things or not do it because I say, oh, shucks, I can't do this all the way or how what time I should. I, first of all, I figure out the craziest ways to do things. And but it gets done. And I always have to tell people and tell myself, who said it's supposed to be done this way? Who said my shoestring had to have two bunny ears? Today it's gonna have one bunny ear because I can't pull the string in through the other side. So things like that, we have to continue to push ourselves in ways as to say we're not looking at, we already defy statistics being the fact that we're survivors. And in reality, stroke is probably, it used to be like the number two, but it's almost to me, I really believe it's like the number one debilitating factor of uh, any ailments um, today in the world. So the fact that we are survivors, we don't have to be the statistics to say, guess what? We are disabled. We can't live our life. We can't, we, we can't, we, it's, it's, we basically, we should not allow our disability to identify who we are. So yes, I have a disability and guess what? People won't even, people honestly, and I tell people all the time, I'm not going to come on and show you every day as today, my hand doesn't feel like working. Guess what? I'm going to figure out this is how to work it. If it's going to give me a half open or if it's going to give me full fingers open. So things like that instead of, so I'm saying that to say the, the small things are great. And when you get bigger things, bigger successes, that's even bigger. So, so celebrate every small thing from if it's one finger open, if it's partially opening, if your foot is moving today, that is not. And, I, and it's literally, I just thought about something I did the other day. I posted that video. I can open doors and do things like that, but I'm always, I still second guess myself. Like if I have too many things in my hand, like carrying my groceries in, cause I don't like to make multiple trips. I still try to grab all 15 bags. So the other day I was doing, I'm like, shucks, I got to transfer everything to this hand so I can do this. And I was trying to rush in the house, didn't have to go to the bathroom. So things like that, I had to go to so all these things that was happening. Guess what? I opened a freaking door with the left, with the key and everything without thought because of the simple fact that's put it, uh, we didn't, I didn't allow my brain to say, oh gosh, it doesn't quite work like this. It doesn't do this. It was just without thought because what happens is without thought because before we had that stroke, our brain recognized we were able to do that. So somewhere deep inside, even though our brain is still trying to disconnect with some things, there's, it's still there to teach us those things that we were doing before. So like, if you, I really want to say to everybody, start trying to do, do something 
I'm trying to think of, so basically, let's say it this way, the easiest way for me to uh, explain it to you. So I've always been in fitness. So my whole thing was telling the doctors when they kept saying, my biggest thing, they kept saying, we're trying to get your hand open. They kept trying to give me cups and like, so anything you could think of, they were trying to put in my hand. I kept telling them, take me to the gym, take me to the gym. They're like, oh, that's, we can't take, I'm like, okay. I'm telling you, you're trying to tell me to do this, but at the same time, I'm trying to tell you how my body operates. I've been in fitness for 20 years, take me to the gym. Needless to say, they take me to the gym. My hand went from not opening to picking up the damn dumbbell. Like, seriously. And it was, they were like, she just picked up a dumbbell. And so not necessarily that I knew that, but I just was like, get me into my arena, my area where I'm comfortable at. Like, yes. And, and actually then it was funny because they goes, okay, so you're a chef. Let's take you to the kitchen. I went in the kitchen. I opened up the stove. So it was things like that. But I, my biggest arena was in the gym. So once they figured that out, it was great because they even changed my therapist. They got me with somebody that was more physically active to have her start pushing me more. So whatever your field is, whatever your excitement and your passion is, figure that out, everybody. If they say, hey, you know what? I was doing this before, but you're a hairdresser. You may not necessarily, your clients may not necessarily say, I'll let you do my hair. Grab a mannequin or something, start doing the hair. Do a thing that you did before that was your passion. So fitness is my passion. So, and I, I had a problem in the beginning as, because everyone looked at me as where I'm from as, hey, the big fitness bodybuilder. So in the beginning, I didn't necessarily come out and everyone did see me at the gym because I was like, shucks. They'll see me going from lifting 500 pounds to now lifting 50 pounds. So me, that was my own insecurity as shucks. I got to go to the gym. They're going to be like, what the hell? What are you doing with that little bitty weight on Tracy? So it took me a minute to deal with that. So now I laugh about it. Like, okay, guys. I'm going to pick up this 500 pounds, but who's going to help my left hand if it drops it? So I do things like that. So it's okay. with I'm okay with it now. But so I'm just saying those little things, figure out whatever your passion is, whatever your love is that you were doing prior to your stroke. Let's start going back to doing things like that. So even have a guy that I'm working with, he plays guitar. And I keep telling him, pick the guitar up in your hand. So yes, Brad is frustrated because his fingers with a guitar, I don't, that's very hard. I even tried to do that. I'm not, a, uh, I don't play, but I tried as when I was trying to work my fingers to get back up. And my niece is a violinist. So she had me just trying to work the, uh, the what do you call it, the strings, trying to get those together as to work those fingers. But something like that, that's not my, that's not my art. That's not my passion. So for him playing a guitar, I'm just asking him to put it in his hand every day to do things, to figure out what was your favorite song, your favorite melody, start playing around. And even I did with the piano. That's something I totally never did. And that is frustrating as heck because uh, more power to any musicians on here having to read music that my brain already didn't work and to move my fingers, that was very hard. I will say, if you want a challenge, try to play piano. Oh my gosh. So the, my piano instructor did not care the fact that I was a survivor trying to learn her. She was like, she was treating me as any other student, read this music and play this song. And I was like, okay, yeah, you're crazy. So once I got my fingers working, I will say I stopped that because that was way hard. So more power to all musicians, but really find what, what that passion is that we had prior to your stroke figure out how to put yourself back into that field. I'm going to stop talking now because I could talk for days. So any questions from anyone? So my question was, how long after your stroke did you start working out again? Um, well, really working out, honestly, let me see, Dave, very much. April. April. Wow. That's I would play around with the weights, like picking up the dumbbells, but really started working, getting back into a facility and like doing real weights was in April. So it was not pretty at all. I actually, I just, now that you said it, I don't really think I ever put any of those videos up. They were, I had them because I said one day I'll put the story together. It was not pretty at all. I would pick up a weight. I would drop it a million times, but it's totally fine. So that's right there to tell you, be comfortable with that. And I would tell people ahead of time, don't walk around me or stay around me. And I have my own space that I'm going to work out. I'll drop it a million times, or I may do something because of the propio, the lack of the proprioception. Like I'll go to step and my left foot will be back here. So everything was completely off, like completely off. But doesn't mean because it's not perfect, don't do it. So yeah, in April, so that was four months uh, post-stroke. Mm -hmm. That's impressive. Yeah. Anybody else? At the four, like, I'll just ask a question, like, uh, uh, in addition, like, 
piggybacking off of a four month post stroke, did you jump back in at the level that you were at before the stroke or did you ease in? And can you talk about your process of like getting back to where you were lifting whatever weight that you were before? Yes, I definitely did not jump back into where I was post-stroke. So if I was to say, when I was going to California for the fitness show, my goal was to uh, get into a powerlifting show. And I wouldn't necessarily say I'm a powerlifter. I'm just a small girl that's pretty strong. So I like to just walk into those shows without register because they look at, oh, this little bitty 150 pound girl, what is she going to do? And then I would beat all everybody out. So I, my goal was to go there to do, which my PR on deadlift was like 405. By April, please, I wasn't even lifting. <laughs> I wasn't lifting. I couldn't even pick up the bar. And the bar is 45 pounds. So that right, that was very frustrating for me. But at the same time, I was like, okay. I kept saying, we got to figure out this hand. But even that, I figured out I couldn't even get to that, that level until I got more coordination. So even though I started back in April, that's when I started learning. I didn't even have the coordination because with the appropriate, lack of appropriate session and then what is it? Tonal. So say, for instance, if you're doing something, so my effective side is my left. If you're doing something with your right, like if you guys ever pay attention, it's so weird. Like if I'm holding something in my right hand and I'm trying to focus on this and the left hand just does, like it'll give you a, like I can I try to do my thing. It'll do something crazy as hell. Like it doesn't want to corroborate correctly. So I was dealing with that a lot as when I'm trying to focus on to step to do a lunge or something. And somebody would be like, Tracy, you don't have a weight in your head or Tracy, your foot ain't moved. So all those things. So I had to back it up. Like, okay, so I can't just go into the weights, even though my brain and my mind wanted to, I had to start working on the coordination. So I had to step back with coordination. And that first, one of my first things was the coordination as to learning how to actually get marches and things like that. And the coordination being to actually move opposite left leg with right arm. So that sort of thing right there. See, with those simple moves that we don't think about, but that right there, once I mastered that, please, like literally, I didn't think about it in the beginning. I started off and it was a progression step from there. I started off with just learning how to march in place, went from marching in place to then actually stepping forward with the march. But then after I stepped forward with the march, the hardest part was to actually add the arms. Adding the arms, you wouldn't think it would be the hardest because now you have to add the arms and the leg to move at the same time. So I did that progressively standing in place and then I do, I do remember, I think I posted a video one time when I finally got the march. It was like, the, you would have thought I was running the marathon because I was so pumped. Like, oh my gosh, I'm marching and I'm moving in place. And everybody's like, oh my gosh. And I, it was like, literally, but I didn't realize like that was the starting point of once I figured out the coordination of march and moving march. After that, girl, you couldn't stop me. I started running and doing everything. So I will say my run still was crazy as hell because with that, yeah, I got the coordination back, but still not having the feeling in my left arm. So I'll be running and this arm will be doing this and this left arm will just stay, stay like this. So that right there was still great for me because I would have, have people around me recording. So I record and I'm mad. Like, I could have sworn my arm was moving. They're like, you thought so much. So it was kind of, I was, I never get mad at anything. When everybody had everybody around me turn into a joke, joke. I forgot what they were calling me. They start calling me all these weird, like turn into a joke. So I would tell them instead of waiting till I'm done with the exercise, say it, me, me an exercise so I to fix it. So that was just, it's good to have people around you that's going to tell you that you, so well, I'll get done with something. I'm like, did I do it? They're like, no. Okay, tell me myths so I can figure out how, because then I had to learn how to try to feel it, even though I don't have full feeling your body does begin to feel something. And then what I learned with that is, so it's, oh, it's, it's because it doesn't come easy. I have to over, over exert things. So even running now, so instead of normally this arm would do this, like you'll find, you'll see me doing all the way like this. And I don't care because now I'm actually making sure I move because I'm doing all the way like this because I'm bringing it in front of me to make sure it's moving. So instead of before I could run like this, I can't see my arm like this and I can't feel it. So I literally run doing one of these like full force exaggeration. So things like that to get your body going. So that's why I always say it's not gonna always be pretty, but we don't care, it's gonna get done. So the smaller things that may start off not pretty, eventually you're gonna perfect it. And then it's gonna, it's gonna be pretty to you. And I don't care, pretty to the next person because who's it to say, look at that person. Everybody's form isn't right. Everybody's form isn't gonna be good. And you're perfect, you're dominant. So the crazy thing is, 
I'm right handed, but I was left dominant. So that's what I'm still trying to figure out. So when my family starts showing me videos of things, I'm like, what the hell? I never used my right hand for anything. Now, that's why I keep telling myself, Tracy, you have to get this hand back as full dominant. Like from shooting to cutting, cooking, I'm chef. Everything I did was left. Like videos I have, teaching the kids classes, I never used my right. So I'm right handed, but I've always been left side dominant. So it's very weird and trying to figure out how to master that. I still play around with the knife now to do things just to get it. And I can do it, but it's very slow. I just still, I'm not moving as swiftly. But so yeah, I am right-handed, but I've always been left side dominant. So it's kind of like that was my dominant, but kind of jacked it up. I think Amanda had her hand up. Man, we actually, I saw Haas. You had your hand up as well. So I'll let Haas go. And then Amanda, you can go right after Haas. Go ahead. So let me ask you something, Tracy. How how did you motivate yourself to go get back into the gym? How did you so, motivate yourself? So Haas, that's one thing. So one thing I tell everybody, I absolutely love working out. I love working out. So I always tell people, figure out the things that you love and you really enjoy doing this. So therefore it's not, it's not a discipline. It's not something that says, oh, I don't really want to do it. Like, okay, I don't necessarily enjoy doing the physical therapy exercises they're kind of rhetoric to me and stupid I'm sorry to say but so I don't enjoy doing that but I enjoy lifting weights I enjoy doing those activities so I figured out the things that I love doing I had to figure out how to get back in tune with doing that so that was my motivation like yes I probably don't want to go to your physical and I and I actually did I stopped going to physical therapy I don't want to do all this physical therapy I'm gonna just go back to doing what I know how to do and that was working out and then slowly start progressing and doing the things that I knew how to do for myself and getting myself back in, even though I couldn't move as fast, but that was my go-to to push myself to. So you got to think about how, like, what are some of the things that you loved doing before? Was it, did you like working out before? No, I played tennis and I couldn't go back to the tennis court because of my leg. And so I really of- wanted to play tennis, but I couldn't play. So how's what's going on with your leg? No, my my leg is like 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 weak. Like when I even when I like try to run, I uh, my leg jerks. Where'd she go? Right. Okay. So yeah, but you weren't scared when you were going. You were working out again. You weren't scared. No, and like I said, I told it. I would tell everybody around me. Guess what? I'm probably gonna drop this. I'm probably gonna drop that. It's probably yeah. gonna look crazy, but yes, in spite of so, I'm gonna say I don't know too much about tennis so you said you couldn't go back because of tennis so you've never seen anybody play tennis sitting in a chair I don't know if that's possible but have you ever tried to play tennis sitting I I tried like once like in 20 I think it was 17 but I just couldn't do it because I couldn't run back and forth so I just left it okay so wait I'm gonna challenge you so my next thing is so I don't know, don't they have, well, I think it might be racquetball or something. Don't they have those confined rooms, those smaller rooms that people do stuff? I don't know what it's called, that they hit something back and forth, that therefore you don't have a large space that you have to run around to. Are those I think I've seen. I think I've seen that somebody doing it on uh, Instagram, actually. I'm going to look into that. So that right there, and I'm just challenging you because, so yeah, tennis, you run it back and forth or... See about if you can, a small sector maybe in your house, if you had a small, yeah. I'm just thinking of a closet. Like I'm just thinking of if you had an empty closet space or something like yeah, that. Yeah, just so go therefore, like this. So yeah, it's more of a shuffle. Start off with something small as a shuffle because like I said, I didn't. I wasn't able to jump back into 400 pounds. Yeah, Initially, no. I did get there, but at the same time, I had to slowly walk through. So with your tennis, you have to slowly walk yourself through as yeah. you can't run. You probably can't do the quick, fast moves of the job, but you can do no. the small ones. And even with that, with the foot movement, try starting off in a chair with your foot movement. It's like picking up. So I, I call them chair marches, chair marches, mm. and chair shuffles. Starting off doing things like that. And the more you do that, and that doesn't take much. Like as we're sitting here now, we could be doing chair marches and chair shuffles, just moving yourself back and forth. And eventually what happens is you start to strengthen it. It may not be 100%, but you begin to strengthen it slowly. Yeah. Just just to give you some encouragement. Of, I, would, try, I don't yeah. want you to not go back to doing it ever. Yeah. It's, it's probably not going to be pretty. And it's, you're probably not going to be as great as you were, but I really believe that you can still do it. 
Yeah, no, thank you. Awesome. So I know I see we have some more questions coming up in the um, chat. So just to make sure we're kind of going in the order. Amanda, you were next. And then I saw Sarah has her hand up. And then Seung Min Young had a, a comment in the chat. So that's sort of order well addressed. Amanda, the floor is yours. Okay. So I got really big into working out and I was doing powerlifting and boxing in 2019. Really enjoyed it. Loved every second. And then and then COVID happened and I got stuck at home and I actually had my stroke in November of 2020 while I was working out. So oh. to this day, and now I'm starting to get back into the gym and working with my trainer, but every day, every time I'm so afraid every time. And I want to get back because I do love it. But do you have any, I guess, words of wisdom of how I can try and push that fear out. Like, so my stroke was caused from a PFO. So now every time my heart rate just goes up just a little, I'm like, oh God, I'm stroking out. Like it terrifies me. But it, so you did everyone said I'm allowed to work out. I just, it's my own mind. Okay, so that is in your mind. So I'm just going to say, so, okay, so you did say in the beginning that you were going up to get your PFO closed, correct? Well, we're talking about it as to whether or not I want to do it. I, I don't know. I'm really scared. I want to talk to someone who's had one. Okay, so, okay, two things I have to say to you. So I'm glad you said you don't know that you want to do it. So let's think about this. What was what was your motivation, your excitement before having your stroke to get you going to the gym? I just loved being active. I loved all of it. Being being active and feeling strong, physically strong. So how do you feel now about being active and physically strong? Oh, I'm nowhere near what I was 16 months ago. But do you still have that love for it? I do still have the love, but the fear comes first. Okay, so let's see. Let's figure out how we can put the love in front of the fear. So what was your favorite thing about working out prior to your stroke? I love boxing. I boxed a lot. And I, I think a lot of it was it was a good place for me to put my aggression. But that's so that's excellent. So this this is great. I like how you're going even about answering this because so now I'm going to take that to the next level. So you're boxing and your aggression. Have you started back boxing? I have, yes. So how does that how does that make you feel when you're boxing? It makes me feel really good, except I don't push myself to that level that I did before. Like I just because I'm afraid, but I love I love when I'm in there. And then as soon as my heart rate gets just a little bit up, I'm like, oh fuck. And then I just sorry. <laughs> and then I freeze. <laughs> so, so totally. So let's see. So you love that adrenaline rush that you were getting is it, it helped you release some things. So with now fear is fear, like being fear is something that you should be able to release and to fight against. So as you're in the gym, so think about going back to boxing. So let's, so when you start get to, to get that feeling, can we, can we tra try to transfer that feeling from your mind to the back? Try to transfer that feeling from your mind to the back. So before you love that adrenaline rush and it was a release of you to release anger. So your now your new release may not be well, your new release kind of is anger. Your new release should be anger, anger because of the fear that's trying to take over. So that should be your new release and your new motivation to say, I'm gonna fight, I'm gonna fight, I'm gonna fight. And then at the same time, no offense to anybody, but my faith is the faith in the Lord. So not being that, you have to find, figure out what your faith is. Your faith being that I'm a survivor and I'm going to continue to be a survivor. So being a survivor, for one, I'm going to say we rise above everybody because we sub sub survived death before. We can survive it again. So the thing is, in order, so because we survived it, we can't allow the survival of death to allow us to live in fear because we've already surpassed that. So it's great being that boxing was your release. So we have to allow you, rather you have to put signs up in front of you. If you can put signs up, what you, 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 you get that adrenaline or make your own combination. You can hit a, hit a, have a combination of when that fear starts to come, you need to turn your combination to a one, two, four. 
because that four is gonna that four is a power punch when yeah. you're breaking that. So something like that. So when you so define fear as define fear as one, two, four, whatever your most powerful punch is, because that four generally comes from the body and you're releasing everything. So you have to start to learn how to release the pain of fear to overcome with guess what? At the end of this, I'm gonna feel great about it. And at the end of this, you don't want to so because what'll happen is I don't want you to live the rest of your life to say, hey, I've not reached my successors again because I still have this fear behind my head. And the fear is alive because guess what? You're still living today. You're still moving. You're still able to do these things because it's also a great thing being the fact that where you were right at the beginning of your stroke, did you have uh, full access to uh, use both hands or you had to build yourself back up? I had to build myself back up. It was about eight months that I couldn't use my left hand. And guess what? Now you can use it. So that's another thing as Guess what, fear? You took my left hand away before. Now I got it back. Guess what, fear? And you got to, guess what? We're going to figure out how to defeat this constantly. So you got to just learn how to, and, that, and I'm saying that because I did it for myself. Transferring that, me, because I was always been so independent. Don't like people to try to tell me to do things independent and stubborn. Plus, you tell me my brain weight made me just more reactive. So therefore, I had to take everything out. I had to all those little demons in your head that's trying to tell you this, oh, your survivor is going to happen again. This happened X, Y, Z. Guess what? I was living life before that. Never knowing that. And, and then, so, and I'm going to jump around because as you said, the PFO. So yes. So I ended up having to get, I got that surgery in May, uh, May of 2019. So that was something I didn't know. They ended up finding out after they were running all the tests, trying to figure out how I had the, uh, the stroke. And that's when they found out running some tests. They're like, you had some situation with your heart. I'm like, I don't have an issue. I've been asking all my life, never had any issues, never came, never in any record. So boom. So they go, okay, well, it's no big deal. You can decide. So when I came back to, so at that point I was in California and Cleveland Clinic is known for like cardio, cardiologists were, were, were whatever. So, and I had some clients there like, well, if you're going to have it, come back home and get it done. So needless to say, I came home and get it done. So just to say that for you as fear of that, me, I didn't even allow one state once we did the test to run and say, okay, you do have the whole, I was like, okay, do the surgery tomorrow. And they're like, we got to talk to the surgeon and you got to talk to your family fat for what I survived this. You tell me this is something that could have caused this or something that could have made this react even worse. And something that could now take the joy from me getting back to my athleticism. Guess what? But no, I'm going to go ahead and close it up. So yes, I lived my 37 years prior of life without knowing it that you say it ha that I had it. So I didn't have that fear before because I didn't have it. So it's like, we can put that behind our head to say, okay, I didn't know I had it and you lived life before. Or you could say, okay, now that I know that I do have, it, am I not going to live like this because I don't have it? Go ahead and let them do this. And it was, it was a simple surgery, I would say in a sense as they put you in like zombie state or something like that because you're not completely asleep. But you're in zombie state and they go through your growing so it's not an open heart surgery anyway. They go through the groin on both sides and they're literally doing it while you awake. Like, so, which the good thing is the reason they do that, I guess, is so they can make sure the pain levels or something. So it was basically, they were looking at my eyes and at one point I did feel it. My eyes got really big. They go, oh, well, we need some, we need some numbing medicine, whatever. So it was simple like that. In and out, I had to, I didn't have to go back in for six. It's like you go back in three months, six months, a year. And then after that, you're fine. So I would say I, I didn't allow any fear or anything. They do the test after to make sure the hole is closed and it's a simple decent surgery. They do tell you after you have the surgery, you can't have any major, like I, I know it was something they said I couldn't have, if I have any infections in my mouth or a dentist or something, that was one of the only things because they didn't want you to go on any anesthetics unless like if that was a procedure you had to have, you had to go back to your doctor who did your heart surgery to make sure they prepped you versus somebody else to make sure everything was good. So that was the only thing I would say about that. But I really want you to figure out how we can rather is to put signs up in front and I'll probably have to turn on the light because it's getting darker. You put signs up in front to say, this is fear that I'm beating or something to figure out. We have to, We I think I want you to make a combination for fear, F-E-A-R. It's a combination. Your boxing combination, the one that gives the most power, your most power moves. And you might even want to add a kick in there. So go from a one, two, four, nine from a kick to really giving you a power move to really move your body all the way around. And again, so, and, and actually that now that I said that I would, I can't remember, I'm doing the numbers too fast, but I want you to do it to the point that you're doing a, something like a left, right, left, right, left. So the thing is, once you get comfortable with that combination, 
you're not even realizing that you're moving your body better than you probably have since your stroke because you're moving your arms and your legs and then you constantly keep doing the combination over and over and then you're gonna have somebody record you like oh my gosh great look how great i'm moving so fear fear can't take your life amanda that's what i'm just gonna say to you fear cannot take your life thank you let me turn this on it's dark in here that was an amazing answer by the way i oh feel thank like you. i have a fear of nothing related to athleticism but um something i'm related that maybe i'll talk about in the future and i'm going to try and figure out some sort of combination or something that i can think that i'll do whenever that fear comes up um, oh you can call me ella you can yeah call me. yeah I, okay awesome. out anyway, so you can call me <laughs> awesome okay amanda great question tracy great answer we'll move okay. on then sarah you have your hand up you can go for it and then we'll move on to the uh, chat sorry my internet is being kind of laggy can you hear me okay yes okay um my question is sort of related to everything we've been talking about um but my struggle is kind of more so not the fear so much in myself, but it's kind of the fear of listening to my body versus listening to kind of medical advice. Um, like you said, when you were doing rehab, you know, you're like, take me to the gym. And I was very much the same. Not, I'm not a gym person, but I was very much the same when I was getting rehab. I'm like, this isn't something I'm going to do every day. Like this, this doesn't interest me like this. I don't find it helpful. Um, so I'm kind of just wondering what you would advise for that. That's great because that takes me to a part of my talk that I forgot about. So the whole thing with that I enjoy doing and I'm trying to push now is working with other survivors as we have to figure out how to find our independence again. So yes, necessarily those repetitive exercises that they tell us to do with therapy are not something we are quote unquote interested in. It's something that we'll do on a regular day basis. So like I said, I had to figure out my therapy is going to the gym. I have to do some type of exercise. So with you, it could be, and it was from exercise and then it was also cooking. So let's say, what is something that you enjoy doing on a regular basis? Um, one thing, well, again, I live in the, um, I live in the prairie, so we have winter like nine months of the year, but I really enjoy bike riding um, when it gets nice out. Okay, so the bike, bike riding, that's an excellent thing. But then we got to think about, okay, so, okay, we're going to come back to the bike riding. So think about something else. So independent living being that. So a therapy exit, I'm trying to think of something that they would have us doing in therapy. I literally said, okay, I can't do the therapy anymore because it became too repetitive. I said, I'm not going to be sitting in a chair doing these exercises. I had to put my mind frame as to, I live by myself. I have to get up and get dressed every day. Let me put my pants on a million times a day. Let me figure out. So I, I literally went through the process of learning how to put my pants on sitting down, learning how to put my pants on standing up, learning how to put shoes on sitting down. So that whole process of an independent lifestyle to learning how to pick something up off the floor, learning how to reach over. Those things are, to me, are the best therapy that you can ever do because that's living again. That's independent lifestyle because once you regain all those things, you don't have to worry about being, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Being, what is the word? Being relying. relying on somebody else, relying on somebody else to do these things for you. So, so my whole thing is what I want us to get the bigger picture is how after our stroke can we learn to live life again? Learn to live life in a sense as we're doing things for ourselves. Learn to live life in a sense that we can still enjoy life outside of that life. What makes you happy? What makes you smile? The things that you did before, did you like, like you said, at bike riding? Bike riding by yourself, bike riding with friends. Yes. So have you tr went back into bike riding uh, post-stroke? Um, I tried, well, it was kind of by... Um, not an accident, but um, I did last summer. I got on like a bike for the first time, and that's because my sister's cat got out, and I was running around town trying to find him. But if it hadn't been for that, I probably wouldn't have. See, I love that. So, so that goes back to what I said in the beginning. So, things that we do without thought are the best things. So, you only did that because you're you were going to find a cat. So, you, your thought process was like rather okay. I 
not jumping in the car, I gotta jump on my bike. So therefore, if I see the cat, it's easy for you to find a cat on the bike. So those things like that, you didn't think about it, so you did. So Sarah, you can do that and you enjoy doing that. So again, it goes back to that without thought. That's just something that your brain nat naturally did without thought before. So you were able to pop right back into it when it came to, it's, it's like fight or flight. That's what it is, fight or flight. Like fight or flight, oh, I gotta pick, oh somebody lost their cat. Oh, let me get on the bike and figure this out. You didn't even think like, hey, I haven't ridden this bike since I had my stroke. I can't help you find this cat. You go, oh, let me do what I usually do. Jump on this bike and let's go find this cat. So therefore, that right there already told your body, told your brain, you can do this. So doing that more and more is going to take you to that. So right there, that's your therapy. And then thinking about things in your in your life as, and me, I always go back to my thought as the things of, I never wanted to have to say, I'm going to be, in my whole thing, I kept saying, I'm not going to be statistic. I'm not going to be statistic. I'm not going to be statistic as being, having somebody push me, walking with this, walking with the limp. And even, guess what? And I tell you all the time, my hand, if it gets too cold, guess what? And my hand's going to go from going straight to trying to freeze itself up. So, but I still, in my brain, I'm telling myself I'm not going to be statistic. So I don't let that, I don't allow that to bother me. I say, hey, guess what? If somebody, if y'all see my arm do something because it froze up on me, y'all put it back down or y'all tell me. So again, me learning how to, you have to figure out independent life because that's, I want to live my independent lifestyle. I want to still go out to restaurants, go out to dance and things like that without having somebody say, oh, she needs help because her hand is or because her arm is like that. Those things that we don't think about doing that therapy is only going to teach you therapy or doctors are going to only going to teach you what they know textbook wise. So textbook can't tell you how to live my life. Textbook can't tell you what we're feeling, the thought process that we're going through. So yes, a textbook in their education or master degree, they said, okay, after a stroke, after a person has a stroke, this is what they need to do to recover. They do not they don't um, prep us for lifestyle outside of like really living. Like how's a person going to communicate with their friends again? How's a person going to, you know, just, just get happy. How, and I, especially the women I work with, how they don't teach you how to stay. Guess what? You're beautiful in spite of like we, we a women as women, we may look at ourselves as, Oh my gosh, my mouth is twisted or I still um, slob. What's the word? Slobber or whatever. If you things like that, we, they, they don't teach you that. That's a, that's a lot of mental, uh, that's a lot of, why my brain doesn't, that's a lot of mental things that we go through because it's just normal. So they're not teaching us that. These are things, that's why it's great to talk to other survivors and figure this out. My whole thought process was the reality of living outside of therapy. And the reality is these things as, hey, you're a woman, you had a stroke. Yes, your face is twisted. That doesn't mean you can't put on lipstick. You can't get your hair done, can't do all these things like that. And I went from not ever, not, I went from being able to do my own hair to guess what? Now I just have to tell my hairdresser. Literally, I'll call her like, okay, I want my hair to go like this. She's like, do, and when she's fine with it now, because I don't, because of simple stuff that I could do myself, she understands as, okay, if you want to change up your hair uh, next week, even though I just did it, just call. So like you figure out those things like that instead of me saying, okay, I can't get my hair done or I can't do it this way because I can't quite do it on my own guess what? I'm going to call this person. She's going to do it because I still want to live life. I still want to get beautiful. I still want to get dressed. I still want to go out. All of those things, that's independent lifestyle and figuring out how to love ourselves outside of the debilitating factors that we might have and mental disorders that we're dealing with on a regular basis. I don't know if that answered your question, Sarah, and you disappeared, the box started moving. No, that was good. Thank you. You're welcome. That was awesome. I was even thinking of different things that I could suggest to other people, like Tracy, when you were saying you, I want to figure out how to put my pants on again. So I practice doing that. You know, if you guys don't like your basic PT exercises that you're doing, and maybe you like fashion or Sarah, I see you have a headband on five, find like five different headbands, pick three different outfits and take some time out of your day and try them all on. And that could be your exercise. Um, Okay, I think we have another question in the comments. Young Min Young, how do you think your love for working out and staying active helped you build a more positive attitude towards your challenges? Actually, that's a great question because if I take it all the way back, everything that I've went through and have how I've trained my body, trained my mind. So doing from bodybuilding to powerlifting to doing bodybuilding shows, just all those type of things. It's the discipline that I that I wanted to build my body and have my body looking a certain type of way. 
discipline my mind to say, I can't stay like this. So the whole thought process, like I literally remember the doctor say, oh yeah, you're paralyzed on your left side. I say, so y'all think y'all about to push me around in a wheelchair? I've got to walk with somebody? I said, no. And they're like, well, that's just the process. And I can't, and I basically, I was arguing with them every day. Like, let me get up and try. Like, I just kept saying, I am because the, my mentality was saying, I want to be able to do this. I don't want to live like that. I don't, and I will not be your statistics. So the discipline of my mind saying, hey, I'm going to go to the gym because I don't want my stomach to look like this. So I don't want my pants not to fit or I want my arms to look like that. That right there, what I discipline my body to say, I love to transform my body in a way because it makes me happy. So we're getting, so that discipline already took off my brain. And then when it came to being a survivor, they said, okay, this side doesn't work. So that took me back to the discipline. I love making my body look like this because I love to look, it was just my own, my own consciousness of how I want to look and what's going to make me happy. I would allow that to take over to say, okay, this left side isn't working. We got to get it back working to the best ability that I can, because this is what I love to do. And I would, I, and I, and I love myself. And that's one thing we have to learn to tell ourselves. We do love ourselves in spite of my debilitating factor, anything I'm going through. Or the, in spite of y'all see me a million times talking today, I forget a word. I'm trying to, Oh, guess what? I don't care. I'll tell people all the time. I can't figure out y'all. And I'll say, you know what I'm talking about, but those things like that, you have to really, it's a, it's a mental battle that we go through with ourselves to tell us that we're not worthy or we're not worth pushing ourselves more. We are. So that discipline that I told myself, my dis so your discipline could be, I'm not sure what you do, uh, and I'm not gonna try to pronounce it. I'm not sure what you do for a living. So say, for instance, if you if you're a doctor, doctor, the discipline to say is, am I just gonna be an ordinary doctor? I want to be a top scholar doctor. Like that discipline to say, I'm gonna study myself, so therefore I don't have to just be this statistic. You wanted to be, a, I, I, I don't know medical terms, but you wanted to be the top of your class. So that discipline that you found discipline in something that you actually love to do, you have to allow that discipline to transfer over to as to make you better than just a typical survivor. If that helps, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome, honey. Samara, well, oh, Samara had a question like oh, a little sorry. bit higher in the chat. Um, she said, do you feel any symptoms still? Oh yeah, girl, all the time. So I have these random things that are, and I'll tell people just randomly out of nowhere. I have, um, today is actually pretty good. This morning was ridiculous because it was cold outside. So my body in cold will go from working fully 100% to just completely left side will shut down. It, it's funny because the right side will be moving like this and the left will just be stuck. So friends and family are like, yo, what is going on? And they're like, we need to get her some heat. So I that right there is probably my biggest thing that I have. Or say, for instance, I still don't have, what is the word? Because I still don't have full 100% feeling in the hand and the foot is probably the worst. So I may walk around the house as, oh, well, okay, I'm going to that. That's what my whole stroking of my stilettos thing came from. I don't know if you guys know about that whole like thing I put together. But the stroking of my stilettos is the fact that I don't have full feeling in my foot. And I love to be in stilettos. And then it was another thing as me, as being a woman, we want to be beautiful. Me being beautiful, I want to get dressed, put on a dress or pants or whatever. And I want to put on my heels and I want to prance around. So because I didn't have the feeling in my foot, so that right there, I said, I want to teach myself how to do it. So worse, whether I figure out how to start off looking in the mirror, and then I had to figure out the type of sh shoes to wear. So therefore I had more control of the foot. So I can put on heels now, but I still don't have the full filler. So I can't wear my six inch stilettos per se, but I can wear a thicker sole heel because, because I don't have full filling with a thicker sole and a chunky heel, you have more control. So I have the control in my leg, but my, so I have a problem because I was already quite bow leg. And then after the stroke, I'm like, I'm insanely bold on my left. So I don't have the strength I would say the strength in my ankle. So if I'm just standing, my ankle will do a complete turn. And guess what? Because I don't feel it, it doesn't hurt. So it's not good because, okay, you could break your ankle that way. So therefore I can't wear stilettos. I have to go with chunky shoes. So therefore I'll put on a chunky heel. It's going to stop my foot from turning out so much. So that thing is like that. So yes, my foot, or if I'm walking around barefoot, which I barely do because I have very hard arches, I'll, I'll 
look on the floor. I'm like, where did my sock go? <laughs> so like, it'll just be gone. So it's just things like that. But in order for me to learn how to do this, so I will say that's something I have to put, push myself more to, to work with one of my coaches of getting that. Um, he's the athletic coach, which I will say I have not been to him in probably six months. And I had to go see him the other day for something. And literally it's probably, I probably dread going to him because he tests everything. Like, well, can you do this with your finger? Can you do this? And sure enough, I walk in, he goes, can you do this? I'm like, no. He's like, oh, you're staying. So things like that is good, but I was dreading going because I know he will. So because he did the thing with the sock and he had me doing something and I didn't tell my sock wasn't off, I ended up being stuck in his facility for a whole hour trying to figure out with me trying to connect the brain with learning how to be cognizant of the things. So I don't have full feeling, but if you really pay attention, you do get a certain feeling in the foot. Like I did really feel like the foot was a little colder. I had a little tingling feeling. So that right there should have made me look and say, oh, my socks is coming off, but I kind of ignored it. So things like that, he was like, okay, you have to be more cognizant of that to pay attention. It's really, so we don't feel, because we don't have the feeling, but really if we pay attention, there was some type of trigger somewhere in the body that says, hey, and it does. And with my foot, usually you do it. I'm like, and I just don't look down, but then being more cognizant makes you be more aware of your surroundings, more aware of those different feelings that you have in your body to say, oh, it does. It. And with doing that, that's going to help me walk better in heels. That'll help with all those things as just paying attention to those small things in our body. Just a small little inkling. Look down or look at your affected side. You may, it, it, it may be something you could have dropped something or you may have touched something that was sharp. But a lot of times we just ignore those things. And I'm saying it because I do it a lot of times. So yes, I do still have issues with this left side. But I don't let it affect me at all. Like I say, I'll just go to the gym and they'll say, yes. And I still pick, I'll pick up the heavy weights now because everybody pretty much knows. And I'll go to pick up something like, well, you just leg press a thousand pounds, but you can't pick up 40. I can't. So because if I do something like that, it's activity wise. So, it's, so that's actually, I'm glad I said that because like, with activity wise, my legs are more powerful. So if, I, if I'm leg pressing a thousand pounds, that's great, I can do that. But when I go to have to pick up one weight to put it back, I've tired my body out. So now my hands are not gonna work. So I deal with that a lot. So I'm looking around the gym like, okay, y'all know I'm not putting this weight back. So, which they, they figured this out already. Like she's gonna lift all this weight, but she can't put it back because I tired my body out. Now my hand is gonna say, we're not picking that weight up to put it back. So I have those type of issues. But like I said, I don't let it bother me. Oh, hey, y'all big enough. You guys over there, y'all can put it back. But I'm st I still figure out how to do the things that I love to do and make it happen that way. I like how you are talking about being cognizant, cognizant of the way that your body feels, even though it might feel differently post-stroke. So for example, I had weakness on my left side after my stroke. And even though it's been 14 years now for me, I still have uh, really minor intention tremors and I notice them a lot when I am working out. So for example, um, I need a mirror when I'm doing certain exercises. I don't know, like if I'm doing like a ra raising like this with my, to work on my shoulder, I will <laughs> notice that this arm is not even going as high or it might do this um, unless I'm looking in the mirror because I don't have as much feeling but if I really do pay attention to how it feels at that time then I can actually really really notice like if I zone in on how it feels even if it's bobbling or I'm not lifting as high then even when I don't have a mirror I can kind of pay attention and tell okay Ella you need to be lifting a little bit higher trying a little bit you're talking about running like this I feel <laughs> like that's kind of how I have to be with my left hand side so um, just to reiterate what Tracy was saying, try and pay attention to the way your body feels. Even if you don't think you have a lot of feeling, something might be telling you that your movement is off and try and uh, figure out if you can tell what that is. So.